The Institute. Institute. Institute for Justice. The National Law Firm for Liberty. Welcome to Deep Dive with the Institute for Justice. I'm Melanie Hildreth, and I'm here with IJ Senior Attorney Dan Albin and IJ Senior Research Analyst Jenny McDonald. Uh, Dan, Jenny, I want to start the show today by playing a quick clip. Insulted. I felt that my father and his father before him worked very hard for this money, and I'm merely taking it from one state to another to take care of my father. And the fact that someone can put their hand into my pocket and just take it without cause was insulting as an American. Dan, those were comments from IJ client Rebecca Brown. Could you describe what it is she's talking about in that clip? She was describing how her father's life savings were seized from her at the Pittsburgh airport as she was traveling home to Boston to deposit that money in a joint banking account so that she could help take care of him and his medical needs. He had, over the course of his life, uh, saved over $80,000 in cash, which he kept in his basement. But after he downsized and moved to an apartment, uh, neither of them felt safe with him having all of that cash in a, in a one-bedroom apartment. So they decided the safer thing to do would be for her to open a joint banking account, deposit the money in that account, and then use that money to take care of um, some dental needs that he had, medical needs, various other uh, things that he needed for his care. And so she was traveling back from visiting him in Pittsburgh to her home in Boston. Uh, she had her money in her carry-on bag as she went through the TSA screening checkpoint. The bag was pulled aside by TSA screeners who began interrogating her about why she had so much money and what it was for. She explained the situation, and they turned her over to a, a state trooper who, again, questioned her about why she had so much money and what it was for, and she again explained the situation. And finally, they, they let her go, and she thought the situation was over. She proceeded to her gate, got ready for her flight, and uh, while she was sitting there working on her laptop, she was approached by a DEA agent yet again, questioning her about why she had so much money and what it was for. And he ultimately seized that money, and DEA attempted to permanently forfeit that money from Rebecca and her father. So it's a, an outrageous story. It, you know, what happens to her, it, it, it's kind of hard to hear. Jenny, it sounds like uh, from research that you've done, and in fact, from a report that we uh, just released, uh, IJ published this summer, that Rebecca's experience isn't unique, that what happened to her happens to travelers just all too often. Could you talk a little bit about that? Unfortunately, Rebecca's story is fairly common. Um, in our Jetway robbery report, we examined all of the currency seizures that happened at our nation's airports between 2000 and 2016. And we found that DHS agencies conducted more than 30,000 seizures and seized more than $2 billion from travelers. Why, why would they do that? I mean, that's a, that is a, that's a lot of money um, to, be, to be taking from people. What is the justification for that? Well, like in Rebecca's case, sometimes it's just kind of a catch-all statute. Sometimes they're alleging, you know, uh, controlled substances violations or something else. Um, but most often, all that the traveler has done to get their cash seized has been to um, travel internationally without reporting that they're traveling with $10,000 or more. So it, it, there's... TSA, in the case of Rebecca, that's taking this money with international travel, it must be other agencies. Like, how many different federal agencies are, are doing this? Again, $2 billion is just such a crazy amount of money. <laughs> it is a crazy amount of money. And we, we know that it's a lot of agencies. Um, so the, the data that we used that we studied for this report comes from the Treasury Department's forfeiture program. So the agencies that are participating are the Criminal Investigation Division of the IRS, as well as Customs and Border Protection, uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, and agencies like that. Um, unfortunately, when we got the data from the federal government, they refused to tell us which agencies uh, conducted which seizure. So we actually don't know who is the front runner and who is seizing the most cash uh, in these instances. But I think it's also important to note that, you know, the Treasury Department is just one of the federal government's forfeiture programs. The Department of Justice also conducts a huge amount of seizures and forfeitures every year with agencies like the DEA in Rebecca's case or the FBI. Um, so this is it's happening all across the country with uh, most federal agencies. 
And now you have groups like IJ shining a light on it. In in the data that you looked at, um, is there any reason to believe that things are getting better? That, you know, with the attention from, you know, the media, from lawmakers, that these agencies are scaling back a little bit and really only trying to use forfeiture when it's really, really necessary? Unfortunately, we don't have any data that's more recent than 2016. Um, but what we do know is there was a steady increase in seizures every year between 2000 and 2016. Um, we saw the number of seizures go up by more than 100%. Um, the value of the seizures went up as well. Uh, whereas air traffic during that time only increased about 46%. So we can't attribute the increase in seizures merely to more air travel or, or more people coming into contact with these federal agents. There's something else going on that's causing agencies to target more cash for seizure and forfeiture. So you mentioned that in, in Jetway Robbery, you you found that it was mostly international travel, like the, the vast majority or um, the, the largest portion, I guess, of the money that was seized was coming from international travel with maybe a paperwork problem. Um, in Dan, uh, Dan, in Rebecca's case, it's not international travel. She's going from Pittsburgh to Boston. Um, what, what was the allegation there? Well, uh, that was a seizure by DEA, and it was uh, from domestic travel. Uh, Rebecca was not traveling internationally. They cited a catch-all drug trafficking statute. They didn't offer any specific explanation about what they thought she had done that was illegal. They just said, well, you've, you've somehow violated uh, drug trafficking laws, and we're going to seize your money because of that. But they had absolutely no evidence of anything related to drug trafficking. It was based solely on the fact that she was traveling with a large amount of cash, from what they will call one known drug trafficking location, Pittsburgh, to another known drug trafficking location, Boston. And they'll say, you know, she fit the profile of a drug courier because, uh, you know, she changed her flight. She had a short duration because she was just staying over the weekend to visit her father. Um, they'll say all of that fits the profile of a drug courier. And that alone will be the basis for the seizure. And those those sound like things that most Americans do all the time, take short trips, um, and it, 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 in, in Rebecca's case, she wasn't trying to hide the money. Wasn't it in her purse? It was in her carry-on bag. It was like an open beach bag that she had. She had it sitting in a purse on top of that beach bag. So it was the very first thing that the TSA screeners could access. Uh, clearly wasn't hidden. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, it's sort of crazy, but DEA relies on a whole bunch of things that people do regularly, buy one-way tickets, make changes to your travel plans, travel between large cities. And uh, one of the crazier things they say is evidence of drug trafficking is no matter how you store your money, whether it's uh, rubber banded or in a Ziploc bag or in a bank envelope, they will say, well, that is, uh, fits the profile of a drug courier because uh, you know, people involved in drug trafficking are known to put rubber bands uh, around their bills. And so you must be a drug trafficker if your money is rubber banded. It, it's completely crazy. So obviously, Rebecca and her father are innocent or they, they wouldn't be IJ clients. Um, but how representative are they really? Uh, Jenny, based on your look at the numbers and the data that you've uh, analyzed, are they typical of the people whose money are, is seized or, or do we know? Um, so we don't have any information in the database about the individuals who had their money seized. But what we do know is that there is not a strong link whatsoever between airport currency seizures and uh, evidence of criminal activity. In less than a third of all of the currency seizures at airports was somebody even arrested for doing something wrong. And if you think somebody is trafficking drugs or money laundering or something like that, wouldn't you think that maybe they should be arrested and questioned. Um, so, you know, we take that to indicate that there isn't enough evidence to warrant actually arresting somebody for a crime. Instead, they just take the cash and go on their way. Um, and I think even more uh, evidence of that is when someone has their cash seized for failing to file that paperwork about traveling with $10,000 or more, uh, less than one in 10 faces an arrest. Um, and in less than 0.3% of the time is another crime like drug trafficking or something more serious alleged at the same time. So all of that tells us that currency is seized most of the time 
on very shaky grounds like it was with Rebecca. And, you know, a criminal investigation never stems from that. But the government does try to keep the money anyway. So you're looking at thousands of instances and, and, and you know, years and years of data. Dan, you have sort of perhaps the other experience of these sorts of situations, which is the individual stories of the people who come to IJ and say, this is what happened to me. This is what I experienced. Um, what is it that you're seeing on that sort of anecdotal level um, with respect to the, the innocence and the guilt and, and the situations that are, are playing out in these airports? Right. Well, anecdotally, uh, IJ is approached uh, by hundreds of people each year who have had their money seized, um, and the vast majority uh, are never charged with any crime. Uh, at least on you know the the level that we're able to dig into, uh, we obviously can't represent all of these people, so we're trying to help them and maybe provide a referral to an attorney who can help them. But a large, a large percentage of them don't seem to have been involved in anything illegal. They're, they're simply traveling with cash for a legitimate business purpose or, or personal purpose. And um, it is extremely rare that someone actually faces criminal charges related to the seizure. In the, in the vast majority of cases, the law enforcement wants to seize the money and send the person on their way and often kind of suggests that, you know, there won't be any trouble uh, so long as you don't make trouble. And, um, you know, it's a numbers game. Obviously, you know, very few people end up challenging these seizures. And so law enforcement, um, is, you know, casts a broad net, casts a wide net and tries to scoop up as much money as it can because if only 5 or 10% of people even bother to challenge the seizures or can figure out how to challenge the seizures, um, law enforcement gets to keep a, a huge percentage of the money they seize. Well, and that's something that you actually analyze in Jetway Robbery, isn't it, Jenny? The the process that people... So if you're one of the unfortunate souls at the airport, your money's taken, you have to go through what Rebecca uh, experienced. What's it like? What what do, what do people... What, what, do, what do people do next? Uh, well... In order to try and get your money back, people have to file a claim for return of property. Um, but what we're seeing is that it's very difficult for people to do that. So most of these cash seizures go through a civil forfeiture process rather than a criminal one, which means they are not entitled to an attorney or the other due process rights that we get under criminal law. Um, and so they have a very hard time navigating this process by themselves. Ultimately, of the cash that's forfeited, more than 90% of it is forfeit, forfeited using civil rather than criminal procedures. So again, that's additional evidence that you know we're not seeing criminal investigations that are stemming from these forfeitures. Um, <clears throat> the difficulty filing a claim is exhibited when we see that the vast majority of property that's forfeited civilly is forfeited administratively. And administrative forfeiture happens when a person uh, is not able to successfully file a claim for return of property. So rather than having to go before a judge and justify being able to keep the cash that was seized, the government gets to just keep it unless somebody comes and successfully navigates this federal law system um, to get their property back. And so the vast majority of people, you know, kind of are set up to fail from the very beginning. Uh, and the, the the sort of Byzantine process was a little bit exemplified in just trying to get this data. I wondered, could, could you talk a little bit about what it was like to get this information from the government? It was not something that they were just quick to hand over. Is that right? That's correct. So we submitted a request to CBP, Customs and Border Protection, for their forfeiture database. It's called CCATS. It stands for the uh, Seized Asset and Case Tracking System. Uh, we requested that back in March of 2015. And at first, CBP just refused to respond to our request because they said it was too broad. Even though we very specifically wanted one database, they said, you know, it's too broad. We can't possibly comply with that. Uh, we appealed that decision, and then they came and said, well, this database is what's called a law enforcement tool or procedure, which means that it's secret and it would hinder public safety if we were to give this information to you, which isn't true because, you know, the amount of money that somebody uh, has seized from them at an airport is not some, you know, secret 
uh, tool that law enforcement needs to keep from the public in order to do their jobs. So we ultimately had to sue them for this database, and we sued them in 2016, and it took then another three years of litigation before we finally got this database. Um, so between originally requesting it and being able to publish the report was took us more than five years. And that's you know one of the reasons that our data are not as up to date as 2020 because you know it took us years to to get this information from an agency that really dragged its feet and tried to stop us every step of the way. So Dan, I, obviously when when you're trying to help people get their property back, there's this administrative procedure that we can go through and to some extent we can we we can and do it at IJ try to help people navigate that. But obviously um our business is suing the government. So in Rebecca's case, that's what we did. Could you talk about the legal claims that are we're making in Rebecca's case and um what you know what uh, in her in her situation is maybe something that would help other people in in that same you know, who's experienced that same thing? Sure. So uh, Rebecca's case is uh, a federal class action lawsuit on behalf of all air travelers nationwide who have had their cash seized or will have their cash seized by TSA or DEA. And we brought uh, claims under the Fourth Amendment that these uh, practices of seizing cash from people simply because they're traveling with what TSA or DEA consider to be a large amount of cash usually five to $10,000 or more, um, does not satisfy the probable re- cause requirement of the Fourth Amendment and violates travelers' constitutional rights. We also brought a separate claim against TSA because TSA is charged solely with um, ensuring transportation security. They are not a general law enforcement agency, and they are not supposed to be doing general law enforcement activities. They're supposed to be make sh- making sure that you know, air travel is safe and people aren't bringing bombs or weapons onto planes. And uh, what's happening here, obviously, is TSA screeners are spending a, a good bit of time uh, helping with seizing cash that has no uh, relation to any kind of transportation security concern, but is solely um, the concern of, of law enforcement officials. And that exceeds TSA's uh, statutory authority as an agency. So we've also sued TSA over um, over their sort of overreach by using the transportation security screening as a kind of end run around the Fourth Amendment. It gets them a peek in travelers' luggage, and then instead of only looking for guns or bombs, they're also looking for cash that law enforcement can seize. And one of the reasons they do that is uh, DEA and other agencies uh, provide kickbacks to uh, TSA agents that um, give them tips about travelers who have a large amount of cash. So there's this really uh, perverse incentive that's going on. Not only do the agencies get to keep the cash themselves, but many of these TSA screeners get bonuses and kickbacks from DEA and other agencies because they've helped identify travelers who have cash. So you mentioned that this is a, a class action lawsuit. What, what exactly does that mean? Other than that, it's not just, you know, Rebecca, we're, we're not just suing on behalf of Rebecca, but a whole bunch of other people. With respect to the, the outcome of the case, what does it mean that it's a class action as opposed to some other type of lawsuit? So if we had just brought the case on behalf of Rebecca, it would still establish meaningful precedent, but it wouldn't be immediately applicable to all travelers nationwide. And we wanted to uh, secure an injunction from a federal judge ordering DEA and TSA to stop these cash seizure practices. And in order to do that and to ensure that it would take effect at every airport nationwide and would apply to every air traveler, we filed it as a class action lawsuit on behalf of this huge class of people, thousands of people who have been victimized by these cash seizure practices in the past and who in the future will be victims of uh, TSA and DEA violating their Fourth Amendment rights. So, Dan, while this lawsuit is is playing out, IJ, you know, obviously we have other cases going on as well, other class action cases, other um, other types of litigation. We also make recommendations to lawmakers, to policymakers. Um, what is it that we suggest that they do to prevent this kind of abuse from happening and, and to kind of end these perverse incentives that have harmed Rebecca and, and so many thousands of others? Well, fundamentally, the problem of civil forfeiture, both at the federal level and at the state level, is driven by this profit incentive, the fact that law enforcement gets to keep 
up to 100% of the cash that they seize, and then they get to spend that money on pretty much whatever they want out of a essentially a law enforcement slush fund. What our what we recommend to legislators at both the state and federal level is to end that profit incentive. Do not send the money back to law enforcement. Send the money to a general fund or a school fund or some other fund that is isolated from law enforcement and that they do not have access to. Once you end the incentives to uh, seize people's cash, there will be a dramatic drop in the number of seizures, the number of forfeitures. So that is our, our primary recommendation. There's, of course, lots of other problems with civil forfeiture, lots of things that, that need to be fixed. Uh, but the the key uh, the key problem that's driving all of this is is those that perverse financial incentive for law enforcement to devote far more time than they would otherwise to trying to find cash from travelers, seize it, and forfeit it. So the last question that I had was just for travelers right now. Do you have recommendations to people as as all of this is playing out, um, so they can protect? themselves and, and avoid having, you know, again, what happened to Rebecca or to IJ's other clients happen to them? What would you recommend that they be aware of or that they do? Well, it's important to know your rights and, and it's important to know your legal obligations. Uh, it is legal to travel domestically with any amount of cash, any amount of cash. If you are traveling internationally, however, whether you're coming back into the United States or you're leaving the United States, if you have $10,000 or more, you have to report that to CBP, to Customs and Border Protection, using a form that they provide online. You have to go find that form um, if you are leaving the United States with more than $10,000. If you're coming back into the United States on the normal customs declaration form, uh, there's a, a checkbox where you can indicate that you have um, more than $10,000. Um, for those who are traveling domestically, um, you know, it is unfortunately dangerous to actually exercise your right to travel with more than five or $10,000 in cash. And that's true whether you're flying on a plane or driving across the country. Um, and unfortunately, I don't have a, a fantastic recommendation for people because uh, right now the government is violating people's rights um, on a widespread basis. So, uh, you know, be aware of the risks, be aware that the, the primary danger is not um, actual armed robbery, but robbery by law enforcement officials who could pull you over or stop you as you're going through the TSA screening checkpoint, and they'll immediately consider whatever they think is a large amount of cash to be suspicious. They'll likely seize it, and then they will attempt to forfeit it. And uh, it's, a, it's a shame that that's happening in America, but we're trying to put an end to it through both our litigation efforts, our legislative efforts, and of course, uh, the strategic research studies that sort of lay all of this out in, in the light and, and show the public what's going on. So be, be aware and, and stay tuned uh, for more, hopefully, good news from IJ, you know, fixing these problems. Thank you both uh, for, for joining me. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's episode, you can get more wherever you get your podcasts or on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe.